Okay. Hello. Hi. <laughs> this is exciting because we're going to talk about comedy songs, and I'm fa as a writer, I'm sure you all are too. I'm fascinated to know how everybody gets into this thing because it's I think one of the harder things to do. Drama is easy and comedy is hard. I think. Um, could you, uh, first of all, I love the fact that you've written a show called Bromance the Dudesicle, uh. everyone. The Dudesicle. It's actually our most serious piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Targeting um, expose on masculinity in America. <laughs> Great. And, and that's going to be your first song tonight, a song called Heartburn. Yes. Yes? Yes. Um, can you set that up for us? Sure. So, uh, Bromance the Dudesicle, as the title suggests, uh, is about uh, a, a group of friends, dudes, who uh, sort of go on a lot of crazy adventures uh, and teach a, a new guy the ways of being a bro. Um, and this song uh, is happens late in the show after a lot of things have gone wrong. Um, and the character Harry is singing it. Uh, he has always been sort of the loving sidekick uh, never quite gets his moment in the sun, and uh, is always sort of made fun of and demeaned by his dudes. Do they like dudes? <laughs> That's it. So we have uh, Will Fuller, who's going to play piano for us. Great. And Damon Gravine, who's going to sing for us. Excellent.
Gastrointestinal. Very funny word. <laughs> and I love that you were able to set words like that. I mean, that's sort of like, kind of like the coin of the realm. Uh, if you can get a funny word like that, and uh, or w words, I mean, it brings out the detail of the character situation. So uh, I, I love that. Um, can you t back up, uh, before we get to the, the this song in particular, can we back up and tell uh, everyone what, what you do in the collaboration? What are your jobs? Yeah, um, it ebbs and flows a tiny bit, but 99% mm -hmm. of the time uh, I write the book, Tyler writes the music, and we share the script. Okay, yeah. Um, so we find that that actually helps with any of the projects that you're talking about, keywords or sentiment or whatever it is. There are so many moving parts that it helps to be able to like share that and bounce it off each other. Absolutely, B yeah, in, in collaborating on the lyrics. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that's right. Do you recall how you started writing this particular song? Was there anything that sparked this song? Um, I mean, many songs in <laughs> romance in general. Bro romance, the entire show sort of came from uh, an actual evening, like at uh, St. Patrick's Day, where I was hanging out with a friend who got very drunk and acted like an idiot, like a bro, uh, and sort of like met this other guy because he stole his beer, and, and then we had to have this hysterical, like, oh my god, you're the coolest dude I've ever met in my life, like, <laughs> oh. like you're never going to call me, like, are you going to be my friend, you know, like this whole thing, and so I literally just texted Kyle that night, and I was like, um, I think I found like a musical, and he thought it was insane. And then, yeah. <laughs> so we started writing a song or two for it just to sort of test it out during the concert, and people loved it. It was actually like our most popular song we've ever written. Um, and so a lot of the ideas initially for Bromance came out of like just funny, funny sort of concepts and situations, right? So we yeah. knew in the bro realm, in the bro realm, we knew <laughs> that Harry was obsessed with food and. Uh, was made fun of for this throughout, so we sort of knew at the crisis point, like, we kind of got to sing a song called Heartburn, right? Like, it, it's yeah. like, I mean, which maybe isn't, <laughs> isn't like the greatest way to explain it, but it's sort of like, there was like an inevitability about a number of things in bromance for, in our minds, yeah. Yeah. this being one of them. But I think you can also say that in order, this is made sweeter by the setup, which is his fun song from the first half of the show is called oh. Chili Cheese Fries. <laughs> and yeah. celebrating, we're going to get chili cheese fries at 11.45 on a Tuesday night. So he's just in a rally <laughs> cry that's so great that when the friendship falls apart, of course he'd be lamenting over something that is the, the uh, effect of yeah. too much indulgence in fried food. Yes. And friendship. And friendship, and friendship. yeah, that's right. French fries and friendship. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, we didn't even know we did that. <laughs> <laughs> Finding something new every day. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's that. Yeah, you just have to get out there and start doing it, and and these these connections occur, right? Um, well, um, okay, great. I, I mean, I, I think what's one thing that's really successful about it is how seriously the character takes the situation at the start of the song. It's like I think there are people. Uh, sorry. I, I, uh, you could approach a comedy song in the waka waka fashion, I'm going to call it, meaning you feel like you have to write joke, joke, joke. Um, and then there's this, this approach, which I think is the way I come at it, too, is you find a character who's in a situation that is inherently funny, but, but, but the character doesn't know it's funny. The character just is being himself and living out the the details and the the throes of, of what he's in like Pepsi at AC and, and <laughs> you know and and, uh, and all those things that accumulate in your song like make us laugh uh, absolutely Frank. and I think that yeah we we don't think of ourselves as joke writers at all we think of ourselves at, you know as creating situations and characters out of which comedy ensues. And I think that even, especially with romance, uh, and maybe we even, I don't know if Sharon Town felt this, that like the expectation from the title Bromance the Musical is like, it might be ridiculous. It might be, it might, it right. might not have any substance. And so how do you keep the comedy and, and fulfill that for people who are expecting the comedy, but also give heart and soul 
And and a song like Heartburn is a fun example of I mean, you actually feel bad for him. I hope he's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But right. You know, I mean, in, in, if you see the show, but like he, I mean, he is in a ridiculous situation, but he cares so much about it. And right. that's And that's the sort of the source of the humor, but also the source of the pathos, which I think is important in the musical in the musical genre. Yes, I agree. I totally agree. Um, let's uh, let's go on to. Um, can we talk about how um, you guys say you you're writing that song? Do you guys have a routine? Do you get in the same room, or how does that how does that work? Well, I think if we're talking about so Michael and I have really enjoyed the process of, of writing full shows, and we we think about songs in context, and sometimes that's bad because you go, oh, is this a is this a good enough standalone? But um, usually, if we take it all the way back, we're thinking about the story that we're trying to tell, mm -hmm. the moments where song makes sense, the uh, the context, and then the content for each of those songs, and gradually chip away at it until we get to where we are. So um, I think once we get to this stage, usually Michael has come up with some cool concept, and yeah. I see something shiny and run with it for melody. You know, and go, oh yeah. <laughs> And so that, we'll, that being a lyric phrase or, or a, a bit of dialogue or something? I mean, it changes a little bit. I think the most, like, the most common version, I guess, would be that I'll write a draft, which is really prosy, mm -hmm. which is not yeah. me trying to, like, write the lyrics yet. Yeah. He'll take it and sort of find some inspiration, and then we'll, yeah. like, then the third one is when we're together, sort of going, how do we really make this lyrics and Strangling, throwing punches, <laughs> yeah. whatever, yes. whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, and that's the most common, but we've written some side by side, and we've written some not in the same room. Yeah. Well, some, some I leave room. more wholly to what you send me. If, sure. if, if, I think it's maybe sometimes harder with comedy songs because rhyme and comedy seem to go hand in hand yes. a bit. Yeah. Um, so if, if we're doing something really lush, then you know I can be a bit more free form with voicing and uh, lyric. In a melody line, but um, there have been times when we'll, it'll just be, "Hey, how's this?" and I'll go, "Exactly as is. Let's do it." Mm -hmm. Or I'll rip it to shreds, and, and the skeleton is what yeah. remains. But yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That that's great. I mean, that that sounds familiar to me too. I'm I'm looking for like that. Fra you know, if it's dialogue, I'm looking for that phrase that could become the title of the song, mm -hmm. and maybe as you as you read the title. And if you're the composer, a melody occurs to you, maybe, on a, on a good day, right? I mean, the, the, like the words sing right. themselves. Um, do you guys, uh, when, you're, <laughs> when you're working on a comedy song like this, do you find that you have disagreements about what is funny and what is not funny? No, there have been certain instances. Where I, I think the, the best one is from the song that Michael was talking about that kind of started bromance. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was a phrase that was, um, uh, what was it? He, he, he doesn't even like me. Um, uh, or we met on St. Patrick's Day, but it doesn't even, uh, but I said, he, I'm not even Irish. It doesn't even matter. And he's like, no, 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 you have to flip it. You have to land on, I'm not even Irish. And like in my mindset, I, I, I was like, it's cute, but oh, it's much better if, if it's like, um, it doesn't even matter. I'm not even Irish. Like it, it just lends itself to be the second beat. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I do think that the, the timing is something that you get, that you have to finesse to get this right. With yeah, the, yeah, the sure. Delivery. And well, we also, sorry, sorry, yeah. No, no, I, I think, I mean, we disagree about many things, but I feel like generally <laughs> what is funny is not what we're disagreeing about. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I think yeah. we have a, a similar sense of humor. I think we, we're definitely... <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, I definitely think there's, there's times when we'll both say, oh, we didn't make it funny enough. We need to, like, figure uh, out how to be funnier. Yes. But not usually times where one person's like, that's hysterical, and the other person's like, no way. Yeah. Okay. I will yeah. say sometimes we have the argument over what's too intellectual and what's too plebeian. 
So mm -hmm. uh, and it's too simple to say like Michael's the intellectual and I'm the common man. But you know we may go and like <laughs> nobody cares about you know a Greek tragedy here. They want to hear ha ha. It's, and, and we have yes. to like kind of figure out the right way to make it the right kind of smart and the right kind of approachable and you know. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I feel like I've got that in my collaboration too. We're we're trying to figure out how to be you know like just like you said smart enough but emotional enough or appealing enough, right? Um, once you've gotten, let's say, the comedy song to the point where you both think it's hilarious, do you have experiences where you get it into a room with an audience and then it's it falls flat, or what has that happened? We kind of do it does happen. Uh, I think the opposite has happened, where we don't think something's funny and, uh. and the audience definitely does, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is weird, because you're like, well, why are you laughing at that? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think, I mean, maybe it's about levels, right? Um, I feel like something that we are forced to battle with just because we're in a fairly small, fairly competitive you know, industry when there's fairly little money to fly around for $50 million productions, um, making trade-offs and saying, every minute is precious. Is this getting us as much as we need it to, both mm -hmm. from story and from like, you know, knock it out of the park, mm -hmm. or the right type of you know, rest from those bigger moments? Yeah. 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 No, I think I'm, probably, I, I'm sure there have been. I feel like in comps, since as I said that we were commissioned to write, um, I'm. I, and we've thrown out many, many, many songs. Like I'm sure there are some that uh, that we sort of went in being like, oh, this is going to be really funny in this moment. And even if it was maybe somewhat funny, it wasn't appropriate, or something, you know what I mean? Like didn't mm -hmm. quite like fill the need of the moment. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. And well, those are the toughest yeah. to lose because you're like, oh, it's so good for these four minutes. It just doesn't make sense in the show. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. But frankly, I can't. I mean, I can't really think of a time when we were like, we are the funniest aces in the world, and everybody else was like, this guy is not funny in his life. <laughs> That's good, I think. I mean, that is good. I'm sure it's happened. Just no one told us. <laughs> Perhaps. And I love what you said before that you come up with something that you th think is not funny, but in the room with the audience, it is funny. That, that I think those are great discoveries. And it's like, it's the only, it's, you know, we're, we, we lead solitary lives as writers, you know, singly or in collaborations. And once you get in front of the living thing that's called the audience, then things change. And that's, uh, I think it's a great thing about theater. You Absolutely. just, you learn uh, what, what is funny that you didn't think so, yeah. right? Um, well, uh, I'd love to hear another one. Yeah. Uh, shall we set up uh, the song called Welcome to My Sleepover Party? Yes. <laughs> so after all of our talk Not about from how, romance. Yeah, you know, all of our talk about how we, it's character first. This is a standalone song for the show. Um, uh, this was a, a song we wrote for a concert we did a couple weeks ago at 54 Below. Uh, which is a late night concert, and they so they asked us if we do a show, and we and said, how about eleven thirty at night? Uh, and we're like, um, I said, well, I'm usually asleep at that time, <laughs> so uh, if we're gonna do it, we sort of have to wear our pajamas. Um, and then out of that, decided like we would make the whole night a sleepover party. <laughs> we're strange, and we thought, well, let's go to a classy joint and make it not classy. Um, so we were like, we have to write a song about sleepover parties, and sort of came up with, but even still, it came up with a situation for a, a boy who is planning a sleepover party, and uh, as you'll see, is a little nervous about how it's going to go. Uh, then hit the jackpot, and we're lucky enough to uh, find uh, our next singer, Luca Padavan, who um, makes anything funny. And charming. Uh, so we had him do the concert, and uh, now we're like, maybe we need to write a sleepover musical. You, you can all help us decide that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so Luca can come up and sing. So Kyle and I are also going to sing with Luca at some point. Great.
hope somebody attends. So I convinced my mom to say girls to watch. Do like my brother, cause he's older, though he's really dumb. I've got cars with my Songwriter Masi Asari. Welcome, Masi Asari. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Right. Right. It is tough, um, uh, but I have a feeling. I, I love your titles. I have a feeling you're, you're going to be just fine here. Your first song is called "Don't Cross Kitty," yes. from Sympathy Jones. Uh, well, and I, I love the title, Simply Jones. That's, 
like a, a spy, a thriller musical. Can you tell yeah, us about that? Yeah, it's different than the musical. It's, it's not as much thriller as Greece. Um, we actually do just a, a Greek American Greek feature in Marissa. Um, I wrote music and lyrics for it, and I traveled around the world for two or three summers and taught that. Oh, good. Um, and it's, it's a super easy musical, and do you want me to explain how the structure of the song is? Sure, sure. Yeah, let's, yeah? let's do that. Here's a star of the show. The song that we're going to do today is actually um, has to do with the faith that our heroine has to fall in order to save the world from imminent disaster and become Jesse Mays a bomb that stops time. So we're going to meet our villainess in the summer. Her name is Kitty Hawk. Um, <laughs> she is um, an Upper East Side socialite <laughs> and recently divorced. And we learn in this number that she's actually the leader of the Secret Coalition for Revenge, Assassination, Terrorism, Counterintelligence, and Heist. <laughs> also known as Stretch. <laughs> so, no. um, and I think I'm skipping around the pointer. So her ex-husband, um, Henry Oswell, a brilliant designer of Oslet luxury watches, um, recently invented a watch that grants the person who wears it eternal life, eternal youth, eternal youth. So, so she's eventually going to use this to mastermind a bomb stop time. I'm telling you this because you might not catch all of it. Right, she's, she's going to use her husband's watch. Yeah, her uh, ex-husband's Her ex, okay, the technology of that yeah. for this. To make an evil weapon. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, in the scene just prior, Oswald, her ex-husband, was kidnapped from his lab and spirited away. And then the scene opens and we see all of her evil minions waiting in a dark alley, led by her um, top henchman, TikTok, who's this, what was this guy? I don't want to give you all the details. Okay, and so they're all waiting for her to appear, and then she appears. And so, and and because so, I'm slow about these things. Yeah. So this is the villain whom Sympathy, Sympathy Jones is going to top or just yeah. stop. Okay, okay, stop her. okay, great. And here is where we meet her, and we learn that she is a villain. Oh, she wonderful. Okay, villain. great. We make both do this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Um, and so we have a great cast. If you guys want to start coming up, and yeah, yeah, great. Jason Lafredo on piano, Stephen Mathis is playing Kitty Hawk. Jordan Stanley is going to be playing Henry Oswald, and then we have Sarah Holland, Katie Ray, Tara Novi, Jenna Brace, TikTok, and Ethan Thompson in our ensemble. And I should say just one quick comment. Jordan is most of the time an evil spy. At certain moments, he steps forward and becomes Henry Oswald, the threatening ex-husband, and then he steps back and he becomes an evil spy. <laughs> <laughs> for world-renowned, highly trained, and very devious evil spy. I have a plan that is brilliant, but kind of complicated, and I'm only just getting started here, so trust me, anyone who interrupts me dies. We are acting on this auspicious day to launch an operation that is nefarious and technologically preposterous as they come. So if you want to live to see tomorrow, which is unlikely to happen because you're idiots, well, then here's a base Shut your trap. 
situation you have you know you've got this larger than life villain and you get to introduce her this is her first song right um, so what when you spotted the song with your book writer then how wh what did you start with how did you start sure. we went through many many drafts I think there were seven or eight previous songs and this um, this was for a last one <laughs> that ah. survived. Right. That survived. Right. So, and I and I will say, you know, it start. This is like a bossa nova number. She was really like slinky. We had we were trying to find the character. That was early, and yeah. then she was like doing a manic show tune. And then the number that we have for a really long time, which um, people loved it, it's called Serve the Orphans. And she was hosting a fundraiser at her home to raise money <coughs> supposedly for the orphans. It was really for her evil cause, and it was very funny. But it didn't make a lot of sense. Like everyone was saying, like, why are they orphans? And she's like, yes, <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so, yeah. so we we figured that out, and there were a couple plot points, like <laughs> like making sure that we saw Otto be k k kidnapped, that we saw the watch. They sort of teased his watch in this number, so we re we redid the number to kind of have her have a rousing chorus with her henchmen and get those plot points in. Yes. Could, are you able to name the titles of all the discarded songs? You said one of them was <laughs> Serve the Orphans. Do you, do you remember the, the other ones? Do you give sure. us just a taste of yeah. wh where you went on this journey? Yeah, I mean, I remember some of them. There, there were some that I first took one lesson and I was like, no, nope, write it again. <laughs> but yeah. I think the very first one was Nowadays. It was like, a woman is left if she can find a decent man nowadays. You know, yeah. It's so hard. She kind of ran off and left them. And it was sort of like, woe is me. Then there was a manic show tune where she was like, I'm off to bigger and better things. Happy to say I did not. Uh, she uh, being a yeah, forget you, Otto. For, my forget you, forget the husband. Yeah. So, so yeah. we were missing a couple key plot things. So this version felt more woven into the arc of the story that we needed to tell. Yes. At this point. Right, right. There's so much to accomplish. Right. Your songs have to do two or three jobs usually uh, to to stay in the show. So um, this is great. I mean, it's a it's a funny song, and yet you're you're serving your story in the ways that you needed to. Yeah. There was a uh, draft that had mimes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, try to keep it on, on task on time. Right, <laughs> right. Right, right. I guess there's, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, the mimes sound funny. I mean, I, you, you're, I mean, right, you're, you're, you're going, you're going for whatever seems funny, right? Uh, um, uh, and, and yet you have to, right, you just said it, stay on task. You just have to keep things moving forward. It can't just be a lark. It can't just be silly for silly's sake, mm -hmm. right? Which is uh, fine. It gets you. It gets you to a certain point, but then when people see your whole show and they're like, "How did you get the watch?" You know, then you have to <laughs> go back and say, "You did it." Yes. <laughs> yeah. That, right. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, it sounds from the way you described. Um, I'm sorry. Say your name again. Brooke. Brooke. Mm -hmm. 
Brooke, from the from the way Monty just said that you said no thanks to a song like right away. It sounds like you've got the client kind of collaboration where you're able to like uh, just be upfront about something that's not working and uh, yeah, we're nice about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She's nice to me. I tend to be the one who's like, this is great. We're gonna have an underwater ballet in Act Two, and, and she's like, mm, let's think about this. Yeah. yeah. yeah right. <laughs> but I think on the flip side, I'm very ruthless. Like, if it doesn't work, I'm happy to just toss it, move on. Like, yeah. I don't care. Um, are there, are, uh, how can I phrase this? Um, is Sympathy Jones, um, does she get comedy songs in this show? Or? That's a good question. She, um, I will say that the villains are the spookiest characters, mm -hmm, right. they get more of the broad comedy. She has some fun numbers, you know, her main theme song is kind of, it's kind of like, sort of like a TV theme song, and she kind of, she sort of has this, oh, here's my life in an office, but I really want to be fun, and she gets this driving bass line, and the Mad Woman's what her life should be like, and she gets this Captain Nero. So she has some fun numbers, but I think that the villains get the, the, the best comedy, and they have the funniest dialogue as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you, for, so you when you landed at this song, mm -hmm. Uh, did, did you come up with the title first, or what, what, what occurred to you first about this one, do you, do you remember? Really, I was having a really hard time with this one because we were trying to get this done. We had a publication show, and we wanted to publish a show and get it out there, and we were sort of on the clock, and I was just, I was like stalling. I remember I brought it into a John Lee Still fellowship session, and I brought the mm -hmm. mind version of it. I knew I had to do it. <laughs> and um, and uh, so I, I, I was listening to a lot of villain songs. You know, like I went and listened to all these like Disney villain songs, uh, and I was like, yes. I think. But we had a version that was a tango, and I was like, I think there has to be a tango, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's there's got to be a bunch of, you know, people singing back up to her, and she's got. Right. I, I don't know. I don't know how we came up with the title. I don't remember how I mm -hmm. arrived at that, but I remember feeling that, that I got the feel of it and the sense of her sort of like perched on a trash can in an alley, like inspecting her her minions. Yeah. Like, yeah. And when you start staging the show in your mind like that and you imagine the backup singers and the dancing, mm -hmm. how does that how does that help you? That really helps me. So at the end of this number, um, they sort of hoist Ocel up and they're parading him around and it's sort of it has sort of a three dimensionality, which is hard to get mm -hmm. in the in the reading format, but um, then you sort of it feels like it has energy, you know, there's a reason for them to be sort of singing in this rousing way and for her to be doing the dum dum dums and um, yeah. Which Jason Lafayette, our great music director, had some great suggestions about dum 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 and the rum rum poo. Yes, and it's great how a musical director, because I've worked with musical directors like you too. Like, yes, a, a good one can make things lots funnier with and choral interjections, mm -hmm. vocal arrangement. I mean, vocal arrangements can be funny, or mm -hmm. there can be funny effects. Mm -hmm. So. I'm so glad you're bringing that into it too, because, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, you can, you you can be funnier with your collaborators uh, pitching in ideas like that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't actually until I wrote the, I actually literally wrote the trumpet line first, and then I was like, you know, what? I can probably sing this. <laughs> nice. <laughs> What's the lyric? And I said, I think it's a rum pum poo. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the beauty of working with other people. I mean, that's, love stories like that. Um, what, can we go on to another song here? This, this being called Subway Romance? Yes. And is this a standalone mm -hmm. song? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about this one? Yeah, this is a song from many years ago, so it's almost like a period piece now. But um, when I first moved to New York, <laughs> over a decade ago, um, I lived in a lot of different sublets. Um, I lived in 14 sublets in four years, and a lot of them were in Brooklyn and Williamsburg. Um, and that was before Williamsburg was sort of like a an out for Wall Street types. It was a really different landscape back then. And I wrote the L train a lot. And so this is a, a song about, about riding the L train and, and being a little delusional at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so I'll just play this one. Oh. Every day across the platform, his eyes and me. 
feeling it in the room here, like the audience, um, there's this tension between what the audience knows and realizes about the character and what the character realizes about herself. And that's a lot of the humor of this, it seems. It, 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 does that seem right to you? Is that sure, I had plenty more in my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. You're, yeah, right. <laughs> Right, I, I, no, I, I'm a nervous performer as well, uh, so I, I, I sympathize with you. Um, the, you, know, you no, you perform it very well. I, I, it just seems like um, it's it's that it's the humanity. Sorry, I don't mean to taking all the fun out of this by analyzing this way, but it seems like it's the humanity of someone who doesn't really uh, who who d doesn't fully understand. But she, she knows she feels something for the guy. Um, and it's the delight we feel in the audience, like figuring out her situation before she has, mm -hmm. that, that makes it funny. Okay. Um, sorry, I, I, no, I just feel like I'm telling you stuff that you, 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 you wrote it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, now, now, he, now here, here's here's something. Uh, what what leads you to write a standalone song like this? It's not going to go in a show, right? But what yeah. what what? Well, I mean, I think this particular one. I mean, like I said, it was years ago, and I, it's kind of great to dust it up and bring it back in because, um, you know, I think I played it for a couple of gigs, like in the East Village, and I was singing bars here and there. And, um, <laughs> maybe I got a kick out of it because you know that. From Bedford, if you take the other thing, know that from Bedford to first out is one song, so yeah. it comes off the beginning. So, so they got it's sort of like an in if you're in the in crowd, you get that extra joke. So, in the East Village, oh. they got it. Um, so I played it there a couple times, and then you know, I think um, I wasn't writing big shows at that time, mm -hmm. so it was I, you know, I had done a lot of children's theater, I'd written a lot of like short songs when I was trying to grow up a little, <laughs> so oh, yeah. Um, I think it was just sort of testing the waters, and it felt more in the musical theater realm, and then I think from there I started writing more longer shows. Yeah. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have a question for Masi? I realize I haven't been taking questions. Or maybe maybe one will occur to you. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, do you do music and lyrics? Yes, I do music and lyrics. Mm -hmm. But you, your collaborator... My collaborator, Brooke, writes the book. So she's, she's a very talented, talented playwright, and we come up with the concept for the shows together. And so that's how we worked on Sympathy Jones. She wrote the hilarious script as well. Right. Great. Um, when you're working with Brooke, or when you worked with Brooke on this project, did Brooke, did you have an outline first? Or what, what sorry, my qu real question is, because I'm often in this position too, mm -hmm. what did you work from? A full book? or an outline or something in between? Yeah, well, I, first of all, I should say that I invited Brooke to come to front, but she, she did say a few things, so <laughs> but she, she should feel free to chime in. Um, so 
we always have a very detailed outline um, that gets revised over time, and that's what I work from. And then Brooke often writes scenes, and then I'll steal all the best stuff from her scene and put it in a song. And mm -hmm. that's, uh, <laughs> so I think, uh, and then sometimes if, if we have a scene and we want to put a song in there, we discuss there should be a song here, and maybe I'm not sure where to go, I may ask her for like a, like a monologue or a little more content so that I can get inside the head of the character a little more. Mm -hmm. And then that helps when I sit down um, to, to songify mm -hmm. that particular scene. Yeah. When you're working on a song that you think is going to be a comedy song, uh, what, what are you, is there anything in particular that you're aiming for or like, is there a joke that you're aiming for, or is there, is there, is, is there anything concrete, concretely funny, let's say, that, that you see as a, like a, a guiding star out in the distance that leads you to write the full draft? That's a great question. You know, I have to say, I was one of the advocates for this comedy theme because I had originally asked for a different theme and then I didn't finish the songs for that theme. So then, and then I was sort of like, well, my songs aren't even that funny, but here we are in comedy, so how do I think about Comedy songs. I think um, I think I liked the comments that were made previously about how it really comes from character. Mm -hmm. I think that's how I approach it. I, I think it's just kind of scary as a writer for me to think about. Oh, I've got to hit this joke. I mean, that it's it's hard to do that well. Some people have a gift for it, um, but I feel like if the characters themselves are kooky enough, the audience will come along for the ride, and the performers will find um, ways to make it even funnier than I imagined because it, because they'll have, will be in the character and the character will take from there. So we've definitely found that. There was a really fun duet in Act 2 for Kitty Hawk and TikTok where they are singing about how much they love each other, but really about how much they love, how evil each other is. And so <laughs> it's all these metaphors for evilness and that, that sort of is a fun gag. But again, it comes out of the character. Yeah. Oh, that, that's a, yeah, that sounds like a fun song. Um, well, great. I mean, yeah, you're, you're, your approach, I think, is a sensible one. I mean, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just the same way. It's like, like a, yeah, having to write a joke. Because mm -hmm. like, who can do that? I get, I, well, uh, Mel Brooks can do it well, right? Like, yeah, uh, he's he's wonderful at that. Um, and then there are you know us mere mortals who <laughs> sort of have to have to make it funny with sort of the the stuff we've got with a character in a situation. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, a any other questions for Mark? Yes. Well, I was the, on that, I was thinking about, you know, where does a funny song come from? And I remember reading about the fact that if you didn't know your rising sign, it was usually connected to some illness. That was how you'd be able to tell what your rising sign was. Mm -hmm. A rising sign in Zodiac? Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. that, you know, if you happen to have um, warts, that maybe it was because you were Pisces. <laughs> so I wrote a whole song about that. <laughs> so that's where that ideas can come from. Sure, that sounds quite funny. Um, well, we have another song from you called And That's Art. Yes. Uh, the show is called I Want a Free Ride to College. Mm -hmm. and, and can you yes, set this up? Yes, absolutely, and I'd love to invite my Collaborator Joy, she doesn't want to come up. Nobody wants to come up. I brought these great, talented women writers in, just for the record. Um, so, uh, for this project, I actually just write lyrics, and I'm working with a great composer, Joy Sun, who's also here in the front row, and Brooke is doing the book. Um, this is a reality show musical about a group of high school students on a fictitious, but nevertheless hit reality TV show competing for scholarship cash. And um, this was an interesting process. So, our Sympathy Jones piece was published a couple of years ago and um, has had a number of productions, and it's actually really popular with high schools. So we're seeing all these high school productions mm -hmm. of The Secret Agent Show. And they throw all these kids in the cast. So you've got 20, 30 kids in the cast, and we thought this is the opposite of professional theater, where they mm -hmm. make their cast as small as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we thought, well, let's write a show for a cast of 20 and pitch it to high schools, and, and let's see if they run with it. So that's what we're working on. It's a lot of fun. And um, this number, it's, I think, maybe more in the zone of it comes from a musical comedy. That's how we are related to the theme of comedy. Um, it's sort of towards the number, towards the end of Act 1, there are 10 finalists who are competing on this reality TV show. There's some judges, some crew members, and we have a cast of 20. 
And um, so toward the end of Act 1, there have been a number of challenges and a number of contestants have been eliminated. And we're following our lead character, Teresa, who's going to be played by Tara Novi. She's kind of a shy, bookish girl, and she moves through the competition and sort of comes more into her own and has some tough choices to make about how cutthroat she wants to be later in the show. So this is a, the next challenge along the way. We've had a couple, and here we are on like three or four. Um, and there's one character named uh, Marcus, who's played by Jordan Stanley, our previous also slash spy, <laughs> who is the favorite to win at this particular um, challenge. But Teresa gets some advice from him, and that kind of turns the odds in her favor. Um, it's quite a long sequence. There's a music in the actual show. There's a, a musical number, and then there's a scene where you get to see all of their projects from Terrible Spoken Word and Interpretive Dances. Mm -hmm. And then there's as a reprise for Teresa. But we're just going to do the first big introduction musical number piece of it. Great? Okay. Show your heartache. 
of that character like getting out of control in the moment it's like it was very funny and it's like it, it's an, it's another of these things we're talking about it's like the character sort of getting beyond himself and and um, it makes us laugh because he's sort of becoming so expansive and he's a little out of control and like it's funny um, so very nice work and it, very, very nice to to meet you and uh, anyone have a, a parting question for Masi before? You, yes, yeah, in the How back. Did you not go for the nude model in the art class. Oh, <laughs> I sent a rewrite. I sent a rewrite. <laughs> well, <laughs> good, good question. Yeah, that's good question. I will say um, I wanted to thank the singers though because this is the first time we ever heard any material from that show, and in just like an hour, basically of rehearsal, this has come together, and I'm just really thankful. So, so I just want to thank them. Okay, well, thank you. Masi Asari, everyone. All right, and finally, um, we have the team of Michael Kuman and Chris Diamond. Please welcome them. Uh, it's a pleasure. This is a special pleasure because... I got to sit down for coffee when I happened to be in Pittsburgh about seven years ago. I got to have coffee with Chris and Michael, and at the time they were considering moving to New York. I think, right? Yes, that, that's yes. what you were. You're, so we we had a little chat about what it was like to be in New York, and you know, uh, and here you are, years later, and you've got a list of awards like as long as my arm. So yeah. congratulations. <laughs> And, and it's such a pleasure to get to talk to you again here and, and to hear some of your work. Thank you. Thank it's, you. It's yeah. a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, good. Good. Well, um, I mean, uh, let, me, let, me just, let me just start off by saying this. I got to, you know, you, you sent me your show, Danny Girl, back around that time. And Dan, am I remembering correctly, Danny Girl is a show about a girl who has cancer, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So imagine that. These guys were writing a show like that uh, as one of your first efforts. Um, and as I remember it, it had, well, it had a tremendous heart, but it also had a fair amount of comedy, right? Yes. Am I, rem I mean, I, I, I don't think you have one of those songs from Danny Girl tonight, but I just wanted to start off by talking a bit about that show and how did you find comedy in cancer. <laughs> Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, that was sort of the big challenge with the show uh, that we we knew right from the beginning that uh, if you're going to write a musical about a nine-year-old girl with leukemia, that it can't be what people expect it to be. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we really worked hard to try and find uh, the joy in it. Um, and it was uh, inspired by, by actual events, inspired by the life of my cousin, um, and if you know anyone who, who deals with, with cancer or, or any, any serious illness, uh, you know, the truth is that there, there are moments of levity. There is, there is great joy. And um, I mean, I, I think for both of us, you know, comedy in a lot of times comes from pain. Um, and, and comedy is, is one way of dealing with that. So um, that was what we, we really set out to, to find, is that when you, when you look at kids who are sick, uh, there's, a, there's a ton of life in them. So that's what we really wanted to, yeah. to capture with that piece. Yeah, I, I mean, I just I, it's I remember really being captivated by it, and then uh, really delighted at how there there was something to laugh about along the way. Um, so and let's and let's move on to a song that we will hear tonight um, called "Welcome to Today" from the noteworthy life of Howard Barnes. Can you set this one up? 
Sure. Um, so after a first musical about cancer, <laughs> what else do you do? No, uh, we, we thought for a long time, what could we do uh, to do something that was just really fun, something co sort of completely opposite of uh, a nine-year-old girl with cancer. So we came up with the idea of a, a guy who wakes up to discover his life has become a musical, and he's on a quest to get out of the musical <laughs> because he hates musicals. Um, and so this song we're going to hear is the actual first number of the show. And you don't really need to know too much setup other than that Chris is going to be playing Howard Barnes, uh, the title character, and I will be playing his neighbor. This song in the actual show ends up being like a huge group number. It starts with two people and then it, it follows Howard on his trip to work and becomes just like an over-the-top group number with like lots of choreography and lots of light changes. And you'll just have to see and hear those in your head. <laughs> So I'm not a super loud singer. <laughs> so if I'm too soft, you can just, you know, do what old people in church do and be louder. <laughs> do in the collaboration? What, what are your jobs? I am music and Chris's book and lyrics. Okay. Um, do you ever, do you ever um, cross over? If, 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of back and forth, a lot yes. of collaboration. Um, you know, we had kind of bounce ideas off each other and give each yeah. other a lot of feedback, and um, so yeah, there is a lot of back and forth. And that's uh, that, that's healthy. I mean, I, I remember when I first started like writing shows with other people, I thought, oh, I, I've got to do my job, and they do their job, and as you go on, I think you find that you're sort of in it together, and like it's the cross pollination that really leads to stuff that you'd never come up with your on your own. Sometimes, definitely, especially with comedy. I mean, I think with comedy, whatever's funny works. <laughs> so, like, we always work with the with the best idea in the room wins. You know, and yeah. sometimes, sometimes just rearranging a couple words makes something significantly more funny. It's really. It's, it's an interesting thing. It's, it's sometimes it's trial and error. It's sometimes it just comes to you the first time. Yeah, yeah, rearranging a couple words. Uh, that leads me to ask, how did you, how did you get the fat guy face? <laughs> <laughs> that was very, like, very funny. I wasn't expecting it. I think we could, because we weren't expecting it. Yeah. Anyway. Do you remember? Ah, that was that was pretty early on there. That was uh, that sort of first um, that first uh, chunk there kind of came out pretty quickly as we were sort of searching for what the song was, um, and it uh, there was something about somebody eating bacon that I, that I thought was particularly <laughs> amusing to, to lyricize. Um, and just, just looking for the exact way to express that so that it you know, landed properly right there at the end. Um, and fat guy face happened to be you know, the, the perfect alliterative uh, phrase yes. to get it to work. Right. And the, right, we haven't talked, really talked much about it yet, but you're right, the, the idea of the joke Landing at the end of the musical line um, makes us laugh. Yeah, that's 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 actually that's a big one. I mean, um, can you can you talk more about that? I mean, uh, how you can, yeah. can point that point the joke. Here we're calling it a joke now. I know we're not supposed to, but but, but <laughs> I, think, I think you can think of it as a joke because a joke has yeah. a punchline, right? And yeah. the, where the punchline occurs at the end of a joke. So if you kind of are translating that to musical terms, if you have a rhyming couplet, generally the joke is going to come at the second part of the rhyming couplet. It's going to be the, yes. the punchline to the joke. So usually that's where jokes happen in, in, a, in a musical song. Yes. Would you agree? Yes, I, I would, yeah. Right, you save the joke for the second line of mm -hmm. the rhyming couplet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. That's And even, <laughs> and even if... It's not that funny a joke. It's being in that position yes. will kind of suggest that it ought to be funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> on, on our bad days, that, that's, that's, I guess, what happens. <laughs> but on the good days, it is, actually is funny, and, and it's in the, in, the, in the right position. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the the, the, the bodily fluids. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the semen, okay. blood, or yeah, 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 right. No. Yeah. That's uh, the title of our memoir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, um, that was another one. We, we, it, that took a while to get that line and word phrased exactly yes. correctly. Uh, and I think it's um, another one of those things that wouldn't be funny if it weren't so true. You know, that joke yeah. plays a lot better in New York than it does anywhere else. <laughs> you know, anytime you sit down in the subway, you sort of resign yourself to the fact that you're probably sitting in somebody's bodily fluids, you know? Um, yes. So the, it took us a while to get the exact kind of... Uh, what is the line exactly? The line is... Um, <clears throat> now you're cruising beneath Manhattan. Oh, what wonders may come to be. There's a chance that the seat you sat in wasn't covered <laughs> in semen, blood, or pee. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it took us a while to get the, the sort of backhanded compliment-ness of, of yeah. that, right? Which kind of comes up a couple of times in the song to figure out, yeah. um, you know, for someone like the main character in this show whose worldview is, is kind of cynical, uh, how to adopt that to musical theater, adapt that to musical theater. Yeah. Um, and so that original joke, I, I think the punchline was always semen, blood, or pee, but it wasn't always... Um, set up properly. It wasn't. It was originally something like, "There's a chance that the seat you sat in 
might be covered in semen blood. You know what I mean? Uh, Something that, uh, that wasn't as funny because it wasn't the opposite. Like the, the humor really comes from playing the contrast of um, an idea that on some logical level is hopeful. You know, the uh, <laughs> earlier, you know, the idea that none of the homeless people have, have exposed themselves to you today is, is a great thing, you know, to, to celebrate. Um, it, it's kind of the joke that we discovered with this song that, that thematically kind of ends up playing out over the course of the story. There's, and that's an interesting thing that I think about, we think about in comedy, like what is the game of this song? Like what, uh, it's, I have a hard time just thinking about how to describe it, but like the game of this song was how can we rephrase horrible things to sound positive, right? Like, um, also, you know, with a little sort of like semi comic theme of like making fun of musical theater, sort of like the opening of a musical that you might think. There's like little things like that, but I would say the big thing was, all the, all the I think, biggest punchlines come from that kind of game. Um, but it, it's interesting that you bring up semen, blood, or pee as well, because that is the, um, that's sort of, that's, for us, that's sort of a, an important part of the song, because for, for, if you're writing a comedic song, generally you want the jokes to get funnier as the, as the song goes on. And that's sort of the last uh, expected joke place, as far as we've set it up. It's the very end of the of the third verse, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. So we wanted that to be the strongest one. Um, but do you do you agree about? Oh, the, of course, you've got to build. The, you, yeah. you, you've got to make things funnier, and yeah. not less funny. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's very smart. And you just and I didn't realize it until you just said it, but but uh, you were you were saving these things for the ends of yes. verses, and then going into your cheery, cheery, chirpy chorus, totally. which is just sort of funny because it's it's grinding into the nerves of this character who doesn't want to be in a musical. Um, and and just, just let me compliment the music, too. We've been talking about the lyrics, but the music is like, it's, it's so bouncy that you expect it to be funny in some fashion. I, I, I just want to go out on a limb and, and say that because music is subjective, everyone reacts differently, but uh, I feel like the, like the music is setting up, uh, setting us up to laugh. Thank you. Wonderfully. Yeah. Um, let, let's move right along. I'm, I'm, we have another song from the same musical, so I really want to uh, make sure we get to have time for that. This is called Gotta Get Out, also from the noteworthy life of Howard Barnes. Can you set this song up? Sure, why don't you set it up? Yeah, so this, is, uh, this occurs a little bit later in the, in the story. It features the, cow the character of Howard, uh, who's been, you know, for 15 minutes or so, trying to wrestle with this idea of what's happened to his life now that it's been hijacked by this musical. Um, and this is the point where he, he definitively declares that he is going to get out of the musical. Uh, to this point in the show, it's important to know that he has not sung yet. He's just been hearing people sing to him. Uh, this will be the first time that we hear him sing. And wow. to play Howard, we have the fabulous Sergi Robles. Ah. <laughs> and uh, as the song begins, he's alone on stage, and he gets hit with a bright spotlight. <laughs> Damn it, that's bright. <laughs>
musical is terrible. Once again, this damn refrain. I swear to God, this music is unbearable. It's driving me insane. I gotta get out. There must be some little trick. Some secret switch to be flipped. So my that I can escape. This god <laughs> To, to pigeonhole this song, but is this a song of complaint? I haven't really thought about it that way. Yeah, we, we sort of think of it as the I want song uh, of the show. Oh. This is, yeah. The I want is I, I don't want to be in yes. the Yes, yes, <laughs> right. Um, which made it, really, yes. it made it really tricky. This We <laughs> talked about this one for a long time before we dug into it because the, the essential challenge of a musical about someone who doesn't want to be in a musical is how can he sing and uh, you know sort of like yeah. do we want him to sing can he sing at all can you get away with not having a protagonist ever sing in a musical um, and so this was uh, the way that we kind of got around that that challenge to have the musical really kind of pulling the singing out of him yeah oh that's yeah that, that's that's a great solution uh, uh, does he well, we'll have to see the musical. Um, I, I won't. I won't ask if he sings more because that th that that is a huge, right? That's a, that's a huge issue. Um, the reason I asked about song of, of complaint is that it seems like a lot of comedy comes from seeing characters in a situation that they don't want to be in, and it's the complaint. It's it's they're complaining that actually leads to some very funny, relate funny relatable comedy. But uh, maybe that maybe maybe I'm wrong to think that about. I mean, he, that's his whole character. Actually, he, his whole character is he doesn't want to be in this musical. So maybe uh, I'm I'm being too doctrinaire about that. I have a feeling. No, I, I mean I don't think that's that's inaccurate to say. I think it's you know part of the fun of comedy is is watching characters actively struggle against circumstances they don't want to be in and, and trying to reverse right. them. So yeah, yeah. I mean that's. And I do that. I mean, that brings up a, an idea that I remember from BMI, the BMI workshop. That mm. uh, you, you really, it's hard to get behind characters that complain, except in comedy. Like, yes. You really don't want to write yes. characters that have a lot of self pity, mm -hmm. um, except in comedy. It's, it's it's something to laugh at, but it's hard to really get on the character side if they're complaining. Yes, that is an excellent point. Um, uh, I mean, the classic one is Adelaide's Lament from <laughs> Guys and Dolls. Um, and you're right, the BMI workshop, the famous Lehman Engel Musical Theater Workshop uh, hosted by uh, a Broadcast Musical Incorporated. Um, yes, that is a wonderful lesson. Uh, uh, I went through that workshop as well, or I dropped out of it, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but before I dropped out, uh, that message of, of yes, you can't sympathize with a, a complaining character, um, but you've, you've stated wonderfully the exception to that rule, which applies to our, our theme tonight. Um, uh, 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 do we have any questions for this team? Well, I just wanted to mention this musical yes. out there called My Life is a Musical. Do you know about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... <laughs> it, yeah, um, I, I... There are two wild parties. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's right. 
Yes. Um, when is this one going to be around? Uh, well, we just did a workshop at the National Alliance for Musical Theater um, last week, so we are starting some really exciting talks. I don't know, I, I can't say for certain when, but hopefully soon. Oh, very good. Um, anyone else? Yes. Can I ask a question about the song before? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, that phrase about the uh, fat bass phrase, you know? Did you, ex I think you ex either extended the music there or, or forced the lyric on purpose, is that correct? No, actually it is the exact same rhythm. It and is. that's something, that is actually a lesson that we've learned quite well, is that you don't want to mess too much with the punchline. Um, as in, let the punchline breathe as you would, uh, as a sort of as a stand-up comedian would. Um, but particularly in the world of musical, if you set up a, a rhythm or a scansion for a lyric, don't break it or try to mess with the punchline. Let it fall naturally. It's a, and that, that what you're referring to, actually, there isn't, I don't think there's a change there, actually. I wasn't sure. It, mm -hmm. it matches another verse with the same? Yes. Okay. Maybe it's just the way it was delivered, which is Possibly. Funny. I'm not a trained singer, so. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Quite possible. No. No I'm, I, I'm <laughs> No, no, I just, I was just curious whether musically that was a musical joke. No, I, you know what, I let the lyrics be jokes. I know I try not to mess with the, with the, with the lyrics too much because I, I, I think in a comedy song, if you're writing a comedy song, it is all about the joke, right? Everything needs to support the joke. And I, last thing I want to do, if, if he writes a really funny line, the last thing I want to do is get in the way with it. In fact, I just want to let it breathe, let it live as much as possible. And um, something that I, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on is, I, you know, I think particularly in a comedy song, the composer has a lot to do with the punchline because you are, are literally, comedy is about timing, mm -hmm. and you are literally setting the time mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the joke. Mm -hmm. So I think music in a comedy song, even though it can't really get in the way of the joke, has to sort of set the timing of the joke. Do you, do you agree, Mark? Yes, I mean, the, the, it, it, the music needs to have led us to that place <coughs> magnificently, efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, th that's that is the total joy of it to me. Mm -hmm. Like you've been able to make the music in such a way that um, the joke lands on those two or three or four notes, mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. uh, and it just feels like it was meant to be mm -hmm. yeah. like that. I, I want to say about your reaction to Fat Face, I, I, uh, I think it, my sense of it is it's because you, in the lyric, the, the phrase fat face was already used like just like two or three seconds before mm -hmm. and we're not expecting fat face to come back that was the lyric surprise of it to me that m maybe me maybe made it seem musically different too but I totally believe you that it's it's the same music mm -hmm. um, sorry that, that I, I that's my sense of why that played the way it did um, we we are okay. running out of time. Sure, sure. I, boy, but let's 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 hear this last song, which is called "If You Only Knew," mm -hmm. from a show called Judge Jack Justice. Yeah. Judge Jack Justice. Judge Jackie Justice. It's um. A show oh, oh is this a misprint here? Uh, maybe, but. That's oh, okay. Right. So, is, oh, sorry. It's gonna be. It's it would be more appropriate because I shall be playing the Judge Jackie. <laughs> oh, okay. It's more appropriate for to be a man. Uh, but this is a, a show that was commissioned by the Pittsburgh CLO. It's sort of a. Uh, a satire on uh, reality television and courtroom dramas, a la the People's Court and Judge Judy. Uh, it's about uh, an aging female judge named Judge Jackie. Uh, and this song is going to be sung by her trusty bailiff, Henry, uh, who will again be played by Sergi Robles. Uh, you'll have to imagine me to be not only uh, a woman and a judge, but also a good actor. Uh, <laughs> it's important to know that, that she, is, she is speaking to the plaintiff and, and defendant throughout this song, and not to Henry, so. Yeah, so it sort of goes into fantasy a little bit. Yeah. Um. You know something? People wouldn't realize what a moron you were if you learned to keep your moron mouth shut. You ever heard that before? Neither did I. I just made it up. I'm going to put it on t-shirts and make a million dollars. Henry, you want to buy a t-shirt? No, Your Honor. Right, because you're not an absolute imbecile like Romeo and Juliet over here. Love. Ah, 
love will make fools of them all, Henry. Everyone but you and me. <laughs> if you only knew. <laughs> something you cast off from the cast of Deliverance. On your best day, you aren't half as smart as I'll be three days after I'm dead. <laughs> you have got this wit that I'm utterly disarmed by. Your sarcastic laugh, it sets my heart on fire. And I must admit that I find myself quite charmed by your cynical Love makes about as much sense as male nipples. <laughs> you show that we're not the stern and sober judge. I see the girl that they don't see. You say it takes a fool to fall in love. Well, maybe the real fool is me. character wonderfully and we're, we're, we understand the situation and uh, anyway it was compliments to you both for like making that happen like how often does usually you have to get into a song a little bit so that, that thank you thank you um, I, I feel we're out of time okay uh, well it's been a total joy uh, first let's let's applaud <laughs> Then, uh, then also let's re-applaud Kyle Ewalt, Michael Walker, and Matthew Starry. Uh, it, it's been so much fun listening to their songs. I hope you enjoyed yourself as much as I did. And thank you to, for, to the Dramatist Guild for sponsoring this evening where we could talk about comedy songs. Thanks. Thank you.